Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Today we're going to be talking with Dr. Hul uh, Kanainendijk of the Institute of Historical Research, University of London, about the Battle of Thermopylae, specifically the myths surrounding it and the historical reality. Uh, Hul, welcome. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on. Uh, though I'm sure I, I, I pronounced your name at least two different ways in the intro now, and I'm sure I'm going to pronounce it in a different way in a few seconds. <laughs> this is uh, what uh, everyone does. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, first, before we get into the podcast itself, I wanted to ask, uh, what first got you into history, and if there are any authors in particular who inspired your interest? So, I mean... I've been interested in history since I was a little child, but I never really thought that I would end up being a historian as such. And even as a, when I went to university to study history, I didn't think necessarily that that was, that was what was going to happen. Um, I think, and this is really terrible, um, I think one of the big influences that got me to actually study Greek warfare in particular, which is my specialist subfield, is actually just... Um, games like Rome Total War and, and TV shows based on it, like Time Commanders, which not necessarily because they made me feel like, oh, this is so cool, this is, I really want to like know more about this, but rather um, to think like, if this is something that we can do, if this is something that we can um, play with in, in modern pop culture, what actually is the basis of that? Like, what is the reality behind these games? What, is, what can we really know about this? How does it act, how did this actually work? And I think that's the main thing that as I was going through my studies as an undergrad, that really got me to focus on Greek warfare and to go in deeper and deeper into that subject area. And in terms of inspiration, I mean, the main author that you end up reading uh, necessarily as you go into the field of Greek warfare is the American Victor Davis Hanson, who writes very engagingly, but also his ideas are very, very ideologically powered and, and often not too compelling if you are looking at it from the perspective of other reading and source reading and, and stuff like that. And so the author that really inspired me was actually um, a scholar who is now in London called Hans van Wees, who, whose work is almost a direct response to that and who really sort of in a very engaging and very compelling way addresses many of the myths that are created and perpetuated by the work of Hansen and other authors and who really has helped to construct a very different and I think much more human picture of what Greek warfare was like. Perfect. And um, uh, by the way, how do you feel? How did you feel about Rome 2? <laughs> I have a ridiculous number of hours in that game. <laughs> it's, <laughs> no, it, it's really fun. It's, it's, it's better in a lot of ways in terms of addressing the source material and, and converting it to a game. But in, even so, I mean, it's a very, very flawed game and it's also a very, very flawed history. It's just like yet another way in which we can engage with this, which shows its own problems and has its own uh, you know, strengths and weaknesses in terms of reflecting history. But it's very interesting as a document to see like how can we use this what do we find interesting about this what is appealing what do we want to sort of gloss over um so it's really fascinating for me it's it's really great that that came out in the middle of my phd um to really make me feel like my work was was you know uh, relevant before we dive into the battle itself what are what is some background historical background that our listeners should know about the battle of thermopylae so i mean the basic background obviously is that it's 480 bc and Persian expansion has been going on at this point for about 70 years. The Persian Empire is the largest empire that the world has ever seen. It's been very successfully pushing in every direction since its inception in the 550s BC. Um, and after a couple of less successful campaigns in the 490s, um, they've now decided the new king Xerxes, after suppressing a rebellion in Egypt, um, has decided to gather all his forces and invade Greece. And he is moving over land. He's across the Hellespont, basically, between the Asian and European parts of modern Turkey. Um, he's crossed the, um, the narrows between the Aegean and the Black Sea. He's marched through what is now northern Greece, um, all the way down into, uh, into Thessaly, which is the area of northern Greece. And basically, the Greeks, who are aware that he's coming, he's got a massive land army. He's got a fleet that is sort of tracing them along the coastline. They know they have to do something if they want to fight this or otherwise just give up and submit to Persian rule, which everybody 
before them has done up to that point, basically. Um, and while most of the Greeks basically say, okay, fine, let's not bother to try and fight this world power, this is futile, um, and give up or, or just stay, pretend that there is a, a third option and stay neutral, a few Greek states decide maybe we should try and resist them. Um, some of them simply because they know that they can't expect mercy because they've previously been involved in conflict, others because they just feel that that is the right thing to do. But there is a lot of internal division. And that's where the particular topic of Thermopylae comes up. So up until that point in sort of the summer of 480 BC, the Greeks have completely failed to mount any kind of resistance. So Macedon has basically just given up instantly. Um, Thessaly was uh, being approached by the Persian army. They sent a message to the Greeks and said, hey, can you come and do something? Can you come and help us? Um, the Greeks did gather an army at that point. They sent some like 10,000 troops north to the pass at Tempe, which is at uh, Mount Olympus. And they said, okay, we're going to hold this pass and we're going to stop the Persians there. And then at some point, they just, a few days later, they just decided maybe not and left and went home. And the reason that Herodotus gives for that is that they were told that the pass could be turned. So there was a path around it, which was indeed, in the end, the path that Xerxes' army took. And so they were just sitting there, uh, you know, setting themselves up to be surrounded. So they decided to withdraw from that position, at which point Thessaly, which is one of the richest and largest sort of flat areas of Greece, um, was forced to submit, um, joined the Persian side. And at that point, the Persian army obviously was advancing further south. And the question was, where or how are we going to stop them? And that's where Thermopylae essentially um, rears its head, because Thermopylae is the pass that leads from, from northern into central Greece. It is a geographical position that throughout history is like the place where you stop an army that's trying to march into the south of Greece. Um, and that's where the Greeks decide that they should make a stand. And... In terms of sources, what kind of sources do we have to understand this battle? Who were they? Were they several? Do we have a lot of sources? So this is, you know, this is a really interesting question because um, fundamentally what we think of when we think of the Battle of Thermopylae is we have Herodotus' story and that's it. That is not quite true. And more to the point, there are several parts of so there are several versions of this story and Herodotus's story is not the oldest one which is really interesting when we think of Herodotus being obviously the most contemporary and the most reliable source so Herodotus writes the history of the Persian wars he describes this story in a great amount of detail but we have a couple of later sources that report the same battle in rather different ways so we can tell that there is another version of this story out there um, and the interesting thing is that you can tell from Herodotus' narrative that he is not, like, this old, this other story is not something that was made up later in order to push a particular agenda or to, um, uh, or to sort of glorify the particular achievements of, of the figures in this battle, but rather it already existed when Herodotus was writing and he rejects it, but it nevertheless persists after him. So in Herodotus, we have one version of the story, and then in later sources like Diodorus, like Pausanias, um, like Plutarch, we have little bits, uh, fragments and summaries of this older version of the story. And the interesting thing is Herodotus was already dealing with this. He was already trying to untangle what part of that, how much of that was true, how much of that was nonsense, how much of that he wanted to repeat, what other evidence he could bring in to question it. But both of these versions of the story are extremely political and both of them are extremely tainted by attempts of different actors within this story to either justify their actions or to put a spin on what actually happened in order to defend their position. Because, of course, this is an existential element of the Greek you know, self-narrative, this idea of where the Greeks come from, what they are, what makes them great. And different states have a lot of stake in defending their position, their part in this story. And so you have Athenian and Spartan and Theban and Phocian and Locrian and Persian interests all conflicting in different versions of this story essentially and also sort of trying to push it in different ways and what's really difficult for us essentially is to disentangle um, which parts of this story make sense which parts of them are likely um, which parts of them are probably twisted to the point of being completely useless um, and to recognize that not a single source that we have for this for this entire battle can tell us exactly what happened None of them even intend to. They're all trying to basically um, push it in a particular way. 
and and so from what you're saying, they were also all all of our sources are basically <clears throat> secondhand at best. I mean, we don't we don't really have any you know any no one who participated in it actually. Well, I mean, well, obviously, you know, the battle, at least on the Greek side, you know, they they were they died. But I'm I'm talking about like there there weren't any like survivors who wrote up first person testimony, right? Well, that's not exactly the problem. So that would be the easy way to say, okay, this is why what we have is not reliable. But it's actually much worse than that. It's the fact that immediately after the battle, and presumably as early as weeks after the battle, um, the Spartans in particular started to dramatically and purposefully distort the narrative. So these are people who, to some extent, actually were there, or at least were involved in and had knowledge of what actually happened, who were deliberately trying to prevent that from getting out. Um, And there were other sources later on who were similarly um, informed by eyewitness accounts, informed by messages that had been received at the time and that plenty of people knew about, but that were not committed to trying to sort those out into you know what actually happened, but we're committed into we're committed into turning this into a story that served a particular political purpose. And so um, we can talk about more detail, more concrete detail later about what actually that means. Um, but specifically, uh, it just means that when we say, "Oh, we don't have a very good source for this," it's not because we don't have eyewitness accounts. We know that at least Herodotus was able to talk to people who were there because he was alive at the time when these people would also still have been around. Um, but also many other communities would have retained some memory of either sending troops there or receiving messages about what was going on there or receiving particular um, announcements about what was going on with the Greek plan or what role they were expected to play in it. So there were plenty of people who had the memory of this battle and what was going on around it. But there was nobody who was trying to sort of write that all down and say, OK, this is what it was. Herodotus tried to do this a few generations later, but by that time, the narrative had become so distorted that it was no longer possible for him to just say, oh, okay, this is what happened and everything else is a lie. And it was it's very clear from his account that he is already juggling different versions and trying to resolve conflicts between them. Got it. And so in terms of the Battle of Thermopylae itself, what, what really happened at the battle? <laughs> right, so... <laughs> This is the tricky part. Um, So yeah, I mean, like I said, the fundamental context that you have to bear in mind is this is a Greek response to this Persian invasion that is happening. And so far, there is an alliance of of Greeks that are decided to resist the Persians. But this alliance is led by the Spartans, and the Spartans so far have made a very bad show of it. They have just not really committed to any kind of defense of the Greeks north of the Isthmus, which is north of the Peloponnese. And it's becoming obvious that they're really not committed to the defense of any Greeks north of the Isthmus, basically. And so the problem that they're facing is how do they contribute to a defense of Greece, which does not involve risking too much of their own assets, which they will need to defend their own territory, basically their own zone of influence, which is the Peloponnese. And so (laughs) what's actually going on as the Persians approach through Thessaly, is that the Greek alliance led by the Spartans has to decide on a strategy to defend them. And the leaders of that alliance are basically not very willing to commit anything to that defense until the Persians get down to the Isthmus theoretically later on um, and actually start to threaten Persian land or Spartan lands. And so what they do is they decide, okay, you know, Thermopylae is too good a geographical bottleneck to pass up. So we have to go and stop them there. Um, So they send a force to Thermopylae. But it is very obvious that that force is much too small to do anything. It is very, very tiny. It does not actually have the sort of, even the look of a force that is united, you, you know, a united assembly of all these Greeks willing to resist the Persians. It is really a token force. Um, they are sent north to hold that pass. And then, as it turns out, as everybody can plainly see, that the forces that are sent are really, really tiny. The Spartans start sending word around saying, okay, in a minute, we're going to ask you all to reinforce us. Um, and then we'll have an actual army and then we'll hold the, we'll hold the Persians here. We'll stop them at Thermopylae. Um, and then it turns out the Persians are actually marching through Thessaly much faster than expected. So they already arrive at the pass. And at that point, um, uh, the Spartans send out word like, okay, guys, those reinforcements had better be coming. Um, but at that point, unfortunately for them, uh, there is a religious festival going on in the Peloponnese, which prevents 
the Dorian states, at least, uh, who are celebrating this festival from sending out any further troops. Um, the Olympic Games are going on, which prevents at least one of their allies from sending troops. And several other states are basically just like, well, if you're not coming, <laughs> you know, we'll see. Um, so there is a very, very low commitment to this battle. There is basically nobody is really up for this fight, except for the local people who just have asked for the Greeks to be sent. So they ask the Spartans, please send help or else we will have to turn. We will have to choose the Persian side. So the only ones who are there in full force are just a couple of Phokians and Locrians who are just behind that pass and then a token force of others. And the plan that they have there is essentially see if we can stop the Persians, but probably we can't and then we'll just have to withdraw and then, you know, we'll see. But for the, the problem there is that for the people who are in central Greece, that is the Phokians, the Locrians, the Boeotians and the Athenians, this is a big problem. You cannot give up the pass of Thermopylae because that will leave everything else open. For the Spartans, it doesn't matter because their critical bottleneck is the Isthmus of Corinth, which prevents land access to Peloponnese. So as far as they're concerned, nothing is at stake. And as far as the other Greeks are concerned, further north of that, um, everything is at stake. And that is fundamentally the problem with the, the march to Thermopylae. So the Spartans are not committed to it. Nobody else is, nobody among their alliance is particularly committed to it because most of them are on the Peloponnese. And north of there, people are really worried that the pass is going to fall because the Spartans are not committed to its defense. So in order to support that, um, that pass, what we see is that the Athenians do everything they can to make sure that the Spartans can hold by sending their entire fleet, 200 triremes, which is a crew of about 40,000 men, which is their entire population, sails out to guard the flank of that tiny land force at Thermopylae. And they fight the big battle of Artemision while the battle of Thermopylae is being, being fought at the same time. And they show that what's actually in it for them is this is an existential threat. They need to commit everything they've got in, into this naval battle to protect the Spartan commitment on land. And the Spartans are just like, well, this is, this is just a sideshow. This doesn't matter. If we lose here, we just fight again. So that is fundamentally the mismatch that's going on where the land troops at Thermopylae are of an inconsequentially tiny scale and the, uh, the naval battle that's going on at the same time, which is fought by the people who really have something at stake in this, um, is an enormous naval engagement, which includes all of the resources that the Athenians can muster. And so from that, I have two major questions. One, festivals that's why they didn't send people out i mean it kind of seems like an as you were saying an existential threat and even if i mean like i mean it's, it's trying to stop them at thermopylae seems even better than trying to having to go to your last final line of defense further south so that that part kind of uh had drew my attention the other part is I noticed that a magical storm sent by Zeus was not what destroyed the Persian fleet, unlike in 300, the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so actually that, um, to start with the latter point, that magical storm sent by Zeus did happen and was very convenient in reducing the numbers of the Persian fleet um, and slowing it down, which was also very advantageous because they were surrounding the Greek fleet um, by sailing around this long island called Euboea. Um, but for the most part, yes, there, there was a huge naval battle which was going on at the same time, which ended up being basically a draw, at which point, because the land force was destroyed, the Athenian fleet and the other Greeks uh, who were there had to withdraw. So that battle was, it went much better in terms of like, at least it wasn't a complete defeat. Um, but for the Greeks, it was not in the end useful at all, because despite inflicting massive losses on the Persian fleet due to the weather and the fighting, they were not able to reduce in its numbers to the point where it was no longer a threat and the position had to be given up in the end. Now, as for the religious festivals, I mean, that's just a big deal generally in, in Greek behavior in wartime everywhere is that they are constantly worried about, you know, obeying the rules laid down by the gods and the Spartans in particular are extremely pious throughout their history and they're always making sure that they are um, obeying whatever omens or whatever festivals or traditions they are supposed to. So if they are arguing that we can't march out because of the Carnea, that is absolutely in, in character for the Spartans. It's very funny to see in a movie like 300 that this is turned into um, Spartan bribery or, or Persian bribery rather. 
uh, that the the oracle was bought to tell them not to march out, which is absolutely unnecessary. The Spartans would never have violated these these things. Um, the key thing is that the three hundred and the rest of the Spartan army um, that is sent to Thermopylae marches out well before the Carnea, at which point they could easily have recruited everyone and sent everyone out, um, but they chose not to. It's not until later that they call for reinforcements that this religious festival gets in the way. So it's <laughs> it's a bizarre thing that we have sort of elided in our modern understanding of saying, oh, they couldn't send more because of the festival. No, that's, that's not what happened. Um, that is a really interesting part of the way that the story of um, Thermopylae is developed. So the Spartans sent very few people. Uh, they sent about a thousand. And then they asked some of their allies to send very small fractions of their levies to support them. And later versions of the story make great pains to justify this. They say, oh, you know, on the one hand, it was because of the religious festival. And on the other hand, they say, oh, they knew they were going to lose. So they sent only a small force because they knew it was going to die. You know, they have this huge narrative that was developed very early on um, in the history of the, um, of the remembrance of Thermopylae, that they were sending out a tiny force because they knew they were all going to die. That was foretold, you know, they, they were aware that it was a suicide mission. And so they sent only so many that they could make a credible, you know, sacrifice that they could say, oh, we committed all these men um, to a certain death in order to save the rest of Greece. What actually clearly happened is that they sent out a very small force because they were only willing to commit a very small force um, to a battle that they were hoping to withdraw from uh, with their pride intact and with their status duly defended. The point was that they, their leadership was already showing signs of not being respected because they were not sufficiently committed to the defense of Greece. And they had to make a statement. They had to do something to show that they were indeed willing to lead the defense of Greece rather than just the defense of their own territory. So they sent a token force, but they had some of their own citizens in that force and they had one of their own kings in charge of that force in order to show to the allies, like, look, we're making a real commitment here. We're doing a real thing. But they still sent a tiny number of men and they asked their allies for a tiny number of men, even the ones who were not affected by the Carnea. Um, so they're really not making any kind of commitment. They're doing the absolute minimum required. Um, and they clearly had hopes of, of, of being able to bring all those men back home as well once the, uh, the action had been either successfully completed or when, once the Persians had forced them to withdraw. Right. And you, I also noticed you said one of their kings. Yes. Yeah, so that's the weird thing about Sparta is they have two kings. Um, this is an, uh, a tradition that comes from time immemorial. We don't understand where it comes from. We don't understand its origins. Um, probably this is something to do with the transition of early village-based Spartan life into this sort of organized single polis in which a couple of families either were unwilling to give up their loss of status and subsume themselves into the community, or it was decided that at least if you were going to have some dominant factions, at least make two of them into a superior status rather than just one so that you don't get this sort of natural abuse of power that would result from a single person coming out on top. But these are all speculations. We have no, no idea, no source to tell us about the origin of the, of the diarchy, the two king system. But it is just before this. I mean, previously, if the Spartans marched out with an army, both kings would be in charge. But just before this, in, the five, in about 58, 508 uh, BC, they marched out against Athens, at which point one of the kings decided that the, uh, the campaign was unjust and he decided to go home, whereas the other king wanted to continue the campaign. And because of that conflict in the leadership, which is obviously very demoralizing, um, the Spartans decided that henceforth only one king could be in charge of an army, which allowed them to keep one of them at home in case of emergencies as well. So one of the kings is marching out with this army, which is, of course, King Leonidas, the uh, old man who had uh, accidentally become king, uh, became king when uh, his older brother committed suicide and his other older brother was exiled and then it was just him left and he was like, wait a minute, am I supposed to be king now? I'm like 60, I've never done any of this, what do I do? Um, he was the one who was, um, who was sent out to Thermopylae. And um, so, and we've talked a lot about the, uh, the Greek side, what did the uh, the the Persian side look at all this? Because uh, how many soldiers did they have, and how are they supplying this massive army? So I mean, we don't really know um, the size of the Persian army, and 
the problem is that our source, Herodotus, is extremely exact about the number, but the number he comes up with is completely unbelievable. So we have his very careful estimate and calculation of the number of men and women and pack animals and slaves and everything else that was involved. Um, but we know that that number is completely impossible. Like he comes to a grand total of more than five million. Um, this is just not something that you know could conceivably have come out of Persia, have been moved over this whole terrain, and have been sort of deposited in Greek terrain with some possibility of supplying itself. It's just not. There's no way. Um, but on the other hand, because that is what our source say, sources say. Um, any kind of attempt to establish what the real number was is pure speculation. Um, but we're talking about a very, very large army that is not in doubt. We're talking about an army that would have included all of the major um, peoples of the Persian Empire and presumably in some level of force, um, many tens of thousands, probably over a hundred thousand, but we don't really have any sense of uh, how large this army was. The important thing is that in the campaign of 480, this was still the Persian show army. So this was an army that was designed to display the power of the empire. So everybody, um, all of the peoples of the empire were expected to contribute some small number of troops at least in order to have this big parade of like, these are all the peoples I rule over. These are all the peoples who have to fight for me. Um, so Xerxes was using this as a display army in order to, uh, to under underscore his legitimacy as a ruler and his power as a king of Persia. Um, it's not until later that most of that army gets sent back home and an elite corps remains behind to sort of deal with the rest of the Greeks. But at this point at Thermopylae, he has the full army. So he has this, this enormous show army that is sort of ridiculously oversized and consists of all these different peoples. And they're supplying themselves, I mean, primarily because they have this huge fleet, which contains many, many hundreds of grain ships, allegedly, which are bringing in supplies from Asia. They're also um, setting up supply posts in, in, ahead, in advance of their march, and they're using their allies to supply them as well. So they come into places and just say, okay, um, the supply and food of the army is for today and these few days is your responsibility, so pay up. And you hear like entire communities having to turn themselves inside out in order to supply this army as it marches through. Um, so this is an incredible uh, undertaking on a logistical level, which kind of shows that a lot of this is about showcasing power. It's not about sort of having an effective military force. It's about sort of showing that um, the Persian king can do as he wants with his enormous supply of manpower. And the you know reality has to bend itself to accommodate that, essentially. Um, which is quite literally what happens. I mean, Herodotus speaks with great admiration of his efforts to bridge the Hellespont with a pontoon bridge and to uh, dig his way, dig a canal through Mount Athos, where previously he had lost the fleet uh, to a storm. He sort of digs a canal through this uh, peninsula to prevent them having to round the Cape, which was previously very perilous. And these kind of enormous undertakings to, uh, to change the very geography of the world in order to suit his army and fleet, these are really sort of um, elements of this Persian royal ideology of look at how powerful I am, look at what I can achieve, like not even the shape of the earth itself is going to be a hindrance to me. And when you, you keep mentioning the show army, was the show army what actually clashed with the, the Spartans at Thermopylae? Or, or was it the elite core? So, I mean, as far as we can tell um, from the descriptions that survived, the, the, the forces that actually clashed with the, with the Greek force at Thermopylae um, were picked troops within that army. They were not necessarily just any old Joe who, uh, who wanted to, who happened to be at the front. So there were people who were, peoples who were selected by the king in order to fight them. And it is likely that that is based either on eyewitness accounts from the Greek side or on accounts from Greeks who were in, in the Persian army, which also is a group of people that Herodotus probably spoke to. And in a couple of cases, we know that he did. Um, so he spoke to Greeks who were in the Persian army, either because they had previously been exiled and had chosen the Persian side or because they had been drafted into that army out of Greek communities. So he had sources to confirm that the people who fought were the Medes and the Kissians and the immortals and other peoples who were sort of core elements of that Persian army, and many of whom actually were uh, made to stay behind when the army was sort of whittled down to its elite core in the next campaign season. So the men who actually fought uh, at the Battle of Thermopylae were also, for the most part, 
um, picked troops within that army. They were not just regular levies. And and what was the uh, the relative, I guess, the, the, the advancement of both military tech and like formations and <clears throat> uh, use of armor and all the rest? Because, I mean, in in the <laughs> In the film 300, uh, the Spartans go around very burly with no actual armor for their uh, upper bodies except for a red cape. And then the Persians also seem to have either no armor or like, I think one had like a wicker armor. And it was really weird. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, that's that's obviously very fanciful. Um, there is... Um... There is an interesting debate about this because of the juxtaposition between that we traditionally picture between um, very heavily armored Greek hoplites. Uh, it's heavy infantrymen who carry like big helmets and, and bronze cuirasses and huge bronze plated shields. Um, and the Persians who are traditionally represented as being essentially light armed troops who wear no armor, who just wear like um, just regular clothing and trousers, that strange barbarian uh, sartorial preference for trousers, which the Greeks really looked down on. Um, and, you know, who basically wear no armor and have small wicker shields and fight um, a sort of skirmishing battle. Um, this is a strange distortion of the reality as Herodotus himself describes it. And as we can also see from other sources um, in which it is clear that the Persians um, they have wicker shields, but they're very large tower shields that will hold out missiles and that they put down um, in battle. They will put that shield wall down as a sort of big wall uh, f from behind which they will start shooting arrows. Um, and that is something that is just not reflected in um, in 300 at all, except for like an initial sort of volley of arrows, which is just sort of shrugged off and exists purely to show this whole like we will fight in the shade bit. Um, Actually, what would have happened with the Persians uh, in close combat is very likely that they would not have just charged right in and started stabbing, but rather would have taken their distance and started firing arrows, which were their primary offensive weapon. Um, they were themselves also armored, or at least in part. They had iron scale armor cuirasses, so they would have, that, have had that on. And then several of the forces in their army would also have had more comprehensive armor because they were simply brought in with their native armament. So you have... Um, Carians and, and Phoenicians and Phrygians and other people, Lydians, who are sort of adjacent to the Greek world and who would have themselves also carry cuirasses and large shields and helmets of metal. Um, you'd have Egyptians who were very heavily armored in all of these descriptions. You would have Assyrians who also carried helmets and cuirasses and had bigger shields. And some of the Persians themselves, according to palace reliefs, would also have carried sort of smaller but wooden shields, which had more resilience. Um, so there, there is a great variety of different weaponry in the Persian army, and a lot of it is obviously much less flimsy than it is represented by Greek sources. The problem there is that the Greeks themselves were already trying to argue that this was one of the key differences between them. And so Herodotus has a very big point about how the Persians lost in close combat because they didn't wear armor and because they didn't have shields. Um, there are ways in which this is arguably true compared to a homogenous force of Greek hoplites. On the other hand, that was not the situation either at uh, Thermopylae or later in the, the decisive battle of Plataea the next year. Um, the Greeks brought a lot of light armed troops with them. A lot of their hoplites would not have been fully armored. Already by this time, the armor of hoplites was being lightened to facilitate a more sort of fluid, uh, a more organized combat style that was less based on individual heroism. So you have people dropping the bronze cuirass and wearing sort of linen cuirasses that are lighter and more flexible. You have these kind of um, adjustments which show that you are no longer talking about these sort of heavily armored men taking on light armed um, archers, essentially. You have heavy infantry on both sides, both of which also avail themselves of missiles, both of which also bring with them a lot of light armed troops that are not intended for close combat. You know, altogether these um, Armament, the armament situation is more similar than any of these uh, traditional narratives makes it seem. Now, in terms of tactics, fundamentally, as I said, the Persian method is to create the shield wall and start firing arrows. The Greek method usually is to have a very large mass of heavy infantry that just sort of charges immediately into close combat. And that is how you essentially how you fight that Persian tactic of sort of forming a defensive formation and then whittling the enemy down with arrows is you charge straight into that and you sort of bring the fight to them. 
However, the Spartans in the Persian Wars, from all of the evidence that we have, suggests that they were kind of behind the curve on the development of this Greek tactic. They were not quite um, on board with this offensive, um, hyper-aggressive uh, heavy infantry tactic of just charging immediately into hand-to-hand combat. What they would do is to maintain a more defensive formation, um, holding their shields out in front of them and having missile troops from behind sort of uh, chucking stuff at the enemy to make sure that the losses would be continuously um, inflicted and then hoping that the enemy would sort of break formation first and bring this into a fight at close quarters. And so what you'd ultimately see at a battle like Thermopylae is actually two really very similar combat styles encountering each other where both sides are mostly defensive. Obviously the Spartans are holding a position so that it's not in their interest to be aggressive. Um, and they're both just sort of chucking stuff at each other and hoping that the other side will go away. And that is one of the reasons why this battle goes on for such a long time is because it just doesn't happen. Neither side really buckles. Neither side has the either the will or the opportunity to just run away. Um, and so they're both sort of standing there and exchanging missile fire and occasionally encounter, engaging in a flurry of, of hand-to-hand combat. Um, without necessarily any, uh, res- achieving any decisive results. And um, it, this is kind of like a, a parenthesis kind of question, just like, I guess kind of like a footnote, uh, which the sources might not actually answer, but from my under- understanding, there were a bunch of Ionian uh, or like uh, Greek city-states that were in uh, Anatolia and that were annexed by the, the Persians, uh, would they have had basically the same level and style of military tech as um, as the Spartans? I mean, with, you know, some differences in tactics, but would they have basically had the same level of tech? No, oh, absolutely. I mean, this is what I, what I was trying to say earlier, is that they had, uh, the Persian army included many people who basically fought identically uh, to the Greeks. They all had an increasing focus on heavily armed, heavy infantry that would fight in homogenous formations and would increasingly adopt very aggressive tactics. And this is something that the Persians had encountered already in Ionia when they conquered these places. Um, and then in the Ionian revolt, just uh, 20 years earlier, when, they had tra- uh, when the Ionian Greek cities had tried to throw off the Persian yoke and the Persians had come down on them and, and, uh, and crushed the revolt they would have been fighting people who were equipped in the exact same way as the Spartans at Thermopylae, and they had won every single pitch battle against them. Um, so there is absolutely no um, reason why the Persians should be surprised, at least on a technological level, by the kind of troops that they encountered, because they had faced those troops before, they had beaten them before, and they now had those people in their own army as well. Um, it's just that the Ionians who were... Uh, part of the Persian army at that point, they had only been drafted into the navy. They provided ships for the Persians. So there was no hoplite infantry present on the Persian side. Um, They just had some marines on the ships which were busy fighting the Greeks elsewhere. Makes sense. Um, So uh, the, 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 the battle happens. It takes a long time because of these... Everyone's basically chucking different kinds of missiles at the other, hoping the other breaks. Uh, what truth is there, if any, to the... Uh, well, I, I think in the film he's a deformed creature, uh, but I think, it, I think I remember that in the original histories he's just some random shepherd who leads the Persians in the goat path. Yeah, so I mean the story of the goat path is really interesting in the sense that um, the story as we know it, as you say, there's somebody who, uh, a local guy from Trachis, whose name is Epialtes or Epialtes, um, there are different spellings. Um, he basically goes up to Xerxes expecting a big reward and a uniform, presumably. Um, and he basically tells him like, hey, there's a goat path. Um, you can go on that goat path and then you can surround the pass. Um, that story is undoubtedly false. There is no question that that story is not what actually happened. Even if Herodotus has a whole thing about how later this man was murdered and the, the, the Spartans rewarded the murderer and thought it was great. Um, because, quite simply, Xerxes arrived with his army at the Pass of Thermopylae uh, four days before the Greeks. Or, or he arrived and the Greeks arrived and they were sitting there for four days. They were not doing anything. The 
story in Herodotus is that Xerxes was waiting for the Greeks to basically melt away, to give up their position in the past. But they weren't doing that, and so eventually, on the fifth day, he sends in his troops to dislodge them. Um, what's actually happening in the meantime is that Xerxes' fleet is catching up with the army and is busy sailing its way around Euboea to surround the Greek fleet at Artemisium. Um, then there's two days of fighting on land and on sea, and then the Persians are led over the goat path and surround the Greek position in Thermopylae. The most likely ex explanation of the chronology of the battle and of the particular events that occur in sequence is that this whole thing was exactly the Persian plan. They were not aiming to batter down the, per the hot gates. They were not aiming to push their way through the actual gates. They were simply holding the Greeks in the pass, keeping them busy with probing attacks until their forces could surround them and hopefully m manage a simultaneous encirclement of both land and naval forces, um, which had to be timed quite exactly. You know, the fleet was behind the army at this point. It needed a couple of days to catch up. Then there was the storm, which further set them back. So they needed to find a way to get around there around the island of Euboea and back up north to get to the um, to the position at Artemisium. And all that time, the army basically had to make sure that the Greeks weren't moving. So they were waiting for the time when they knew that their fleet would arrive. And at that time, they also wanted their army to be behind the Greeks on the pass. Now, according to the story, they needed to be told about this goat path and a local traitor helpfully supplied the information. Um, but the fact is, as Herodotus himself points out, um, this very path had previously been used in a war that had gone on just a decade earlier between the Phocians and the Thessalians. And the Phocians were holding the pass and they built the wall across the uh, pass at Thermopylae, which the Spartans were holding in this battle, or which the Greeks, uh, the Greek army was holding. And in order to dislodge the Phocians from this position, the Thessalians found the goat path, marched around the Phocian position and forced them to give up the position in the pass. So just a few years before that the Thessalians had used this exact same trick to dislodge a force from the exact same position. Now that the Thessalians were in the Persian army, as I said before, they had been forced to submit to Xerxes. So they were right there, able to tell Xerxes, look, we were in the same place 10 years ago, if not more recently, and we just walked around. There's a path right there. Um, for some reason, we're expected to assume that they were just sitting there and with not doing anything and not telling Xerxes anything. And Xerxes wasn't questioning them about this path in the southern border of their territory, but instead waiting for a local Trachean to sort of come up and say, hey, guys, there's this path. It's just unbelievable. Similarly, um, Xerxes, obviously, his army is there for four days doing nothing. Is he just sitting there? Is he absolutely not scouting the position? Is he not trying to make sure that there is no way around the pass? We learned earlier that his way into Thessaly was specifically by an alternative route that allowed his army to avoid the pass that was being defended by the Greeks. So there is a clear sense that he knew exactly how to do this. He knew how to counter a strongly held position in a pass. Um, he was obviously looking for that when he, from the moment he got to Thermopylae. So it's most likely and, and, and really almost unquestionably what actually happened, that the Persians almost immediately found out about the path and tried to use it at the moment when it was most advantageous to them to do so. And in fact, the Greeks knew that this was going to happen. They weren't just sort of sitting there going like, well, I hope he doesn't find out about the path. Um, they knew that the path was there. They had stationed the Phocians in the path. There were a thousand or so Phocians in the army, and they had been set specifically on the path on the top of the mountain to prevent anybody from getting through. So they specifically knew that this was likely to happen, and they were essentially hoping to be able to fight a similar sort of positional battle where they could hold that position as well, block both of the ways through, and then hopefully hold off the Persian army. But as it happened, the Phocians essentially gave up their position without any resistance at all, uh, let the Persians through, and then completely failed to act against the Persians even as they passed, which is an inexplicable event that uh, modern scholarship has not really engaged with in any way, um, but which is very likely to simply be the case that these Phocians betrayed the Greeks. They just surrendered their position. They just let the Persians through deliberately. And this is the ultimate result of that Persian plan coming to fruition, is that the Persians knew exactly where to go, they knew exactly when to do it in order to achieve maximum effect, 
um, and they did it all exactly as they wanted to. So this does not sound like a heroic defeat for the Greeks as much as it used to. I mean, it sounds like everything just went more or less save for the storm and the stronger than expected uh, naval resistance. It sounds like things just went to plan from what you're saying. Well, that's exactly it. When you look at the um, <laughs> the Battle of Thermopylae from a perspective that is not so colored by the sources that we have, who are almost entirely pushing a Spartan, a pro-Spartan agenda, who are pushing this idea that the Spartans made a heroic sacrifice in the past and almost achieved an actual victory, or at least achieved a moral victory against the Persians, who were endlessly frustrated by the resistance they encountered and henceforth were terrified by Spartans and, and by the resistance that they were willing to put up and the extent to which they were indifferent to death um, and incapable of retreat. I mean, this is the narrative that the Spartans were pushing straight away after the battle. Um, that is obviously not what happened. <laughs> what happened is that for a couple of days, there was indecisive skirmishing, which probably cost neither side very heavily. Then, according to plan, the Persians surrounded the Spartans in the path and wiped them out. And that is fundamentally what happened. And there is no way in which um, the number of losses recorded by Herodotus are at all plausible. The number of frustrations that they suffered are at all likely to have stirred them. And in no way in which they would have seen um, the battle as anything but an unqualified victory. The Persians completely won with minimal losses, dislodged a large, a decent sized Greek army from a very strong geographical position at an almost no cost to their, to their army or to their forces or to their morale. I mean, it was a very well executed operation against that pass. And if you look at later attempts to turn the pass, like the battle against the Gauls in 279 or the battle against the, uh, where the Seleucids hold the pass against the Romans in the 190s, um, losses on the attacking side were very high because they decided to engage the troops in the past. Um, whereas in this particular case, because of this sort of standoffish skirmishing mode of fighting, it's very likely that the Persians suffered almost no losses at all. And it's very interesting to see from the narrative in Herodotus that immediately after the battle, where we have this sense of like, oh, this is you know, maybe a, a tactical setback, but a strategic victory because it gave these Greeks the spirit, it gave them this mode of this mindset where they knew that they could fight because this great sacrifice, this great heroic, valorous resistance put up by the Spartans showed them the right example. Actually, there is nothing like that in the narrative. There is only a sense like, well, that didn't work. Um, what's our next step, guys? How are we going to do this? Um, there is no sense in which they gain any confidence out of this encounter. There is no sense in which anybody is trying to pretend that this was a victory. It is absolutely a crushing and total defeat for the Greeks who lost a couple hundred warriors, one of their leaders, uh, one of their main state's kings, um, and an enormous amount of prestige because they completely failed to stop the Persians, largely out of incompetent leadership, insufficient commitment to the battle, and betrayal by their own allies because the Phokians gave up the path. And so basically, from what you're saying, they, 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 in, after the fact, <clears throat> there was just a very strong effort to, to try and say, wait, 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 we meant to do that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> very much so. Yeah. So that is, that is really the interesting thing when you look at the details of the story as it is told in different sources is that there is an immense and very obvious attempt um, to overwrite what actually happened with a sense of like, no, no, this was actually absolutely what we tried to do in order to achieve the, you know, in order to unite the Greeks and give them the example and show them that we are actually really good at um, defending this. The Spartans, as I said, already at the time of the Battle of Thermopylae were already suffering from mistrust among their allies, that they were the right people to lead this fight, that they were not as committed to the defense of, Greeks, of, of Greece as they should be. And they were obviously not, at the time of Thermopylae, trying to do anything about that. They had simply sent a couple of men and a king. Um, and it wasn't really that much of a commitment. It was not something that they were clearly showing, by which they were clearly showing like, oh, this is, um, this is where we make the difference. This is where we, def we, we show that we are committed to fighting uh, for Greece. Um, it's not until after that you see 
really difficult sort of uh, contortions of these facts in order to try and pretend that this was their great sacrifice and this was their great commitment. And one of the things that you can see this in very clearly um, in the original story, which is reported in several sources, in this early story, which was all about like glorifying the Spartan achievement, um, the, the number of Spartans sent is not 300, but 1,000. And that is reported in multiple sources from the classical period right the way through to um, the epitome of Trogus and, and other later sources. There are a thousand Spartans marching to the pass at Thermopylae, and there is no specific um, indication that it was only the 300 Spartiates, the 300 full citizens, who actually stayed behind. The number of men who actually go is not defined in any, um, is not clearly defined in any particular source. We have very different numbers from different sources, ranging from about 5,000 plus to more than 10,000, who are actually sent all together to battle at Thermopylae. Um, the number of men who stayed behind is very unclear. Um, but the selection of the number of men who stayed behind is constantly political, where the Spartans were trying to push the story that it was only them, and other Greeks were trying to say, no, we were there too. And then the, um, the Athenians are trying to say, yes, maybe the Thebans were there too, but it was because they were forced. And so there are constant sort of machinations about who gets to be, the, who gets to claim to have been there, who gets to claim to have stayed behind, who gets to claim to have held the pass um, and fought to the death with the Spartans. Um, and in that, all that turmoil about who gets to sort of claim to have had part of this, that number of the Spartans, the thousand Spartans who go to Thermopylae, um, gets whittled down to just the 300, just the full Spartan citizens, because they later on claim like, no, we had no help from anyone. It was just us, just our own citizens and our own king. We were the ones who fought. We were the ones who sacrificed ourselves. In the older story, they say we made a very substantial, deliberate sacrifice. We sent a thousand people, even though we knew they were going to die. Um, and that was supposed to validate their role as leaders of the Greek alliance. In later versions of the story, they actually say, no, it was just 300 of us. Um, and we didn't initially know we were going to die. We just did this because we knew it was the right thing to do. We knew it was on the moment. It was the sacrifice we needed to make in order to unite the Greeks, in order to prove our our. our position as leaders of this alliance. There are different explanations of this, um, of this action in which different numbers play a part, in which different numbers come out as um, being the correct ones for the people who went and the people who stayed behind, the people who actually fought to the death. All of this is endlessly confusing and different sources can't agree on the actual numbers involved. And fundamentally it boils down to this fact that all of these stories serve the purpose of saying, we the Spartans, actually are committed to the defense of Greece. We are the right leaders for this alliance. If you don't believe it, go ask Leonidas. He's dead over there because he fought for you and died for you. And that is the, the story that they turned it into. But the actual story on the ground is the Greeks were, the Spartans were under committed to this fight. They completely miscalculated the situation. They failed to take adequate measures to prevent their being encircled. And when it finally happened, um, the only redeeming thing that Leonidas could think to do was to stay behind and die. And that is fundamentally what happened in this battle, and it helped the Greeks in absolutely no way at all. In fact, when the position at Thermopylae was turned, central Greece was completely overrun, Athens was burned to the ground, the Athenians were reduced to having nothing but their ships, and their people were evacuated to Salamis and to Troezen, um, and all of Greece north of the Isthmus was lost. Um, so it was a total defeat, um, which is largely down to failures in Spartan leadership. And they tried to turn this into a story which uh, showed them to be the heroes. It definitely con contrasts with, uh, with the popular uh, image of, uh, of the Battle of 300, um, especially in light of more recent years where Frank Miller's comic book and then later the film adaptation 300 <laughs> have kind of shaped, especially in Eng in the English speaking world, have shaped the 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 how we see Thermopylae. Yeah, so you have three hundred. The more recent film, you also have the three hundred Spartans from the from the sixties, and it's very interesting to see how they use different versions of the story in order to complete their little um, their reconstruction of events. Where the three hundred movie that came out recently has the Spartans at the end essentially die in a hail of arrows in the pass. 
whereas the earlier um, movie from the 1960s has them essentially march out through the sea into the Persian camp on a sort of suicide mission to go and kill Xerxes, and they're all killed in the Persian camp. Um, that story, surprisingly, is the older story. <laughs> that is the story that the Spartans told immediately after the battle. That's what they said happened. And that is the story that Herodotus already doesn't believe. Herodotus already says, no, that can't be right. Um, so he is the one who basically gives us the story of them dying in the pass under a hail of arrows because he says that, that that incredibly heroic story cannot possibly have happened. It's geographically impossible. Like they cannot have passed through um, all of these Persians to try and get into their camp. So they were the in these two movies already, you can see different ways in which the Spartans were trying to reflect this defeat as a heroic attempt at self-sacrifice for the good of the Greeks. Most definitely. And um, what, uh, I mean, this this is kind of, uh, Greek warfare is your, your, your ancient Greek warfare is your field of, of expertise. Um, what are some of the kind of big challenges both t still facing our understanding of this topic and i guess because of you know the, the specific context of what we're talking about what are kind of like some obstacles in terms of pop and uh, improving the popular understanding of the battle of thermopylae well in terms of the source base a lot of our problems are simply that our sources are you know as we've discussed before um imperfect and in this particular case heavily colored by political interests when Herodotus is writing, he is already dealing with a very pro-Spartan narrative, with a very pro-Athenian narrative, which um, is specifically attacking Thebans and Corinthians. Um, there are different um, factional uh, conflicts between Greek states that are occurring in his own day, in the beginning of the Peloponnesian War, um, that he is reflecting in his version of this history. Um, but the most problematic, I think, um, the most sort of difficult aspect of this particular story that we do to ourselves, to some extent, that, that is inflicted upon us by both scholarship and pop culture, is attempts to try and turn all this fantastical and, and heavily uh, mythologized narrative into something that makes sense by the standards of the modern military academy, something that is rationalized and stripped down to a number of very clearly considered tactical and strategic decisions. So for instance, um, the idea of is it even sensible to hold this pass uh, when it's obviously known that it could be turned, there is an endless discussion over why the Spartans decided to hold this position, why they sent so few men. Um, in why specifically uh, they sent uh, less trustworthy troops to hold the upper pass, all these kinds of situations. Um, but this, for the most part, makes sense. The one thing that, um, that really troubles and really uh, weakens a lot of modern narratives is attempts to try and explain the fact that Leonidas and the others of unknown number <laughs> stayed behind and fought to the death. This is something that gets endlessly rationalized. And one, um, you know, one account after another will try to explain this as, oh, they were staying behind to act as a rear guard, to let the other Greeks get away, um, to act as a delaying action to see how long they could hold up the Persians in order to, um, to possibly evacuate parts of central Greece that were open. Um, ways in which, you know, as the earliest version of the story says, you know, trying to actually kill or hurt Xerxes, which is even reflected in the, late, in the 300 movie, where allegedly Leonidas' aim was just to wound Xerxes to show people that he was a man. Um, this kind of thing is, is, is completely ridiculous. There is nothing in any source, any ancient source from any period, that suggests that the uh, act of Leonidas and the others who stayed behind was a rearguard action. That is not mentioned anywhere as a rationalization of this move. Um, the only reasons given in Herodotus, Diodorus, in, uh, in Justin, in any other source um, are entirely down to Leonidas saying, this is the right thing to do. We have to do this. Um, it is a self-sacrifice purely for the glory of Sparta, fundamentally. It is a self-sacrifice that serves to affirm that the Spartans deserve to lead the Greeks because they are the most willing to take the, take the pain when it comes, fundamentally. And there is no other reason. Nobody else brings up 
oh, it saved the rest of the army. They were getting away anyway. They were just getting out while the Persians were turning inward to make sure that the troops in the pass would not get not would not escape. Um, there is no question that these troops would be able to get home. There is no question that they would be um, somehow chased by this massive Persian army, which would immediately, uh, you know, go into pursuit mode somehow and mobilize itself through this very narrow pass in force to try and get, the, you know, get these fleeing Greeks as they were running away. There is no question of this. Um, the two reasons that are offered for Leonidas to stay behind is firstly the older version of the story, which is that he received an oracle saying that one king of the Spartans had to die in order to save all of Greece. This is the self, self-justifying Spartan story that they told immediately after the battle. They said to everyone, look, we, this is what we meant to do. We meant to sacrifice one of our kings because we were told that this would save all of Greece. Um, sounds great, except, of course, we have no independent evidence of this oracle. This is something that they told other people in order to justify their move. Herodotus already says, I don't really believe this. I think that it was simply because Leonidas thought that it was not allowed, it was not right for him, having been assigned to hold the pass, um, to yield, to give it up. And in light of all that we've been discussing, you know, in light of this sense that these Spartans were, you know, everybody knew that the Spartans were not sufficiently committed to the defense of Greece, that they were not doing all they could to defend the Greeks. It suddenly makes a lot of sense for Leonidas to consider when he's in that pass, if I run away now, nobody's ever going to believe that the Spartans are going to have the, you know, the interests of Greece in mind. No one's going to believe that we should um, follow the Spartans in this, in this mission because the Spartans just don't do what they say they will do. They don't hold the pass when they say they hold the pass. They don't commit forces when they say they will march out. And so what I must do and what I must do not just for my own personal glory and for the glory of the men with me, but for the sake of Sparta as a leader of the Greeks, is to stand here and not walk away, even though everybody else will do so. And Herodotus already shows the uh, the actual situation there, which is not that he sent the others away and said, you guys need to march ahead, we'll hold the rear guard, but rather that everybody who's there with them basically just left on their own accord, disobeying orders, because they preferred to live rather than die there with the Spartans. So the choice to stay obviously becomes heavily contested later on where different uh, different peoples claim that they were also there and that they also stayed. Um, but fundamentally, that choice to stay is a voluntary one by the leader of the army who no longer had any control over his alliance, who no longer had any control over what the other states were doing, even the ones who were subjected to Sparta in the Peloponnesian League. So even the peoples who were supposed to obey his orders were just like, no, that we're out of here. Bye, go and, you know, if you want to kill yourself, you can go do that, whatever. Um, we have business to attend to. Um, so he stayed behind. He could keep only a few hundred with him, um, including the 300 Spartan citizens or how many, however many of them were left, um, and some other people who then decided that that would also be the best way, in or, uh, best way to secure for their communities everlasting glory and to prove to the rest of the Greeks that some were willing to give the ultimate sacrifice. Wow, it, it, it definitely, it, it definitely um, um, is in that this new interpretation is definitely in conflict with, with a lot of our popular understanding, at least my even my popular understanding. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of this that we just kind of have to acknowledge that the Greeks don't necessarily have to think like us. They don't need to think in terms of like, oh, um, you know, when we're talking about this rearguard action uh, explanation, we expect them to act like modern generals with a staff college and a lot of intelligence and a lot of information and a lot of sort of careful considerations of how to preserve the most of their army. I mean, most of these were just common people, like they were just citizens who had been brought out to fight in an army that was clearly understaffed, that was clearly too small, um, under leadership that they were already questioning. Um, and they didn't necessarily make rational decisions. The Phokians in the pass um, betrayed the whole of central Greece and betrayed the Spartans down below um, for the sake of their own personal survival and possibly for the sake of the, um, their political position in a focus that was uh, occupied by the Persians. I mean, there were very personal and very emotional reasons involved for people doing different things. And somebody like a Spartan commander saying, um, we must stay here and die, 
is entirely in line with their upbringing, entirely in line with the values they espoused about themselves, and doesn't need additional tactical or strategic justification. Um, but it creates this overall story, which we simultaneously want to accept and question. Something where we're like, oh, this, this heroic sacrifice of the Spartans in the past, you know, this heroic um, deed for the sake of all of Greece. But also, hmm, maybe we kind of want to make this make sense. We don't just want to accept that they just did that. They just sort of stood there and took this, uh, this punishment that they knew was coming. Um, so it's very difficult for us to make sense of this. And it's not just because the sources are so conflicted and because they are so heavily colored by, polit by po contemporary politics. Um, it is also because, you know, these Greeks don't act like we might expect them to. And they tell the story in a very particular way that suits them. Um, and in terms of uh, good things that are happening in your field, what are some recent advances in our understanding of this topic, uh, if any? that you think would be worthy of, of highlighting? Well, so the thing about this particular battle is that, I mean, we've obviously always looked at it way too much from the perspective of Herodotus' story of Spartan heroism. And even that is already quite qualified compared to the other older version of the story, which is even more um, triumphalist about what the Spartans did. Um, but it fundamentally reflects a very Greek perspective and one that is almost always um, narrowed down to an Athenian and Spartan perspective. And I think increasingly what you find now, apart from more balanced and nuanced readings of this evidence in light of the other source material and in light of the chronology in which these things were written and the political motivations that may be behind it, um, are also considerations of different perspectives. So there is research on the Phokians and what their role and what their motivations may have been, uh, research on um, the Thebans and their place in this whole situation and how they um, try, how they would have, would have uh, reacted to the other Boeotians who were also present with whom they were constantly in, in, uh, in conflict of who should be leaders in Boeotia. Um, but most particularly the Persian side of things, which we previously just didn't separately study at all, but which increasingly now is um, is a subject of study and allows us to think in more detail about what this was like from the Persian side. Um, not because the Persians necessarily left us a lot of source material to work with, but simply because it will allow us to think about this from a different perspective and to look at this from the angle of people who may have had very different uh, you know, assessments of what actually happened. And this is what leads us to you know, conclusions like the one that I just sketched out in which the Battle of Thermopylae is absolutely a Persian victory and one which probably made them feel quite accomplished and quite at ease with the, uh, the, uh, the ease with which they dealt with the Greek resistance, the level at which they were sort of able to brush that aside in just a few days and march on. Perfect. So I think our listeners now have a pretty solid idea of some of the myths of the Battle of Thermopylae and some of the, uh, the, the uh, pieces of the reality that we've been able to piece together uh, in light of more recent scholarship and critical thinking about uh, some of these myths which have kind of colored our, our vision of the past. So I think they have a great, uh, I think this has been a, a good uh, and very useful opportunity to talk about uh, this battle. So um, Dr. Rul Konainendijk, thank you again for coming on. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. Please support us at patreon.com slash askhistorians. Find more history like this by following us on Twitter and Facebook and by visiting us at askhistorians.reddit.com and ask hundreds of historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know about history.